Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuki. And today I'm very excited to be here. This is my very first major talk in front of such a big and amazing audience. Thank you. <laughs> so I am very nervous. And I figure out maybe instead of me doing an introduction, I'll have someone else do it for me. So I made this little program. Here is our heroine today, Yuki. Uh, she just arrived in Prague a few days ago, and she really likes beer. So she was looking forward to the Czech beer. Praha, home of Pokemon. Caution, dangerous amount of Czech beer ahead. But today, you know, is the day of her talk, so she needs to pass the beer place and go find the conference hall. There we go. Wow. This is an amazing conference hall. Oh no, all the audience is already waiting. Go, 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 Yuki, hurry up. You need to find your stage. Go, 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 go. Hurry up, hurry up. Okay, there we are. There she is. Here I am. So today, I'm going to talk about my journey building a Game Boy emulator in, Reason, uh, in Rust and WebAssembly. So first, a little bit of background about me. I studied CS in university, but not the CS as computer science. I studied cognitive science with uh, the specialization in HCI. But I still do program. I played around different languages, and I have been working uh, as a full-time engineer for about a year now. But still, there are some traditional computer science ideas that is very uh, fresh to me. So a lot of things that might feel natural and obvious to you are some complex and mysterious problems for me. For example, while I was playing around with different languages, I realized everything eventually compiles to one and zeros and run on a computer. Hmm. But wait a minute. What do we really mean when we say compile? And what are we referring to when we say a, co a program is running on a computer? Does a program have legs or something? And all those small questions started to point to this bigger question. What is programming? What is a computer? So this is actually a very scary question to, to ask for me, because a computer is just a black box. It is some kind of magic for me. But if I have those questions stuck in my head, and I cannot get rid of them. Maybe I should conquer my fear. And the way I conquer my fear is by doing something bold, like building one. But our modern computer, like Mac, is very, very complex. What about something small and simple? A Game Boy. It holds some memory. It has a display screen, button, play sound. It is a legit computer. So my adventure with Game Boy emulator starts. And today, we will be following four steps to go through our story. First, we will try to figure out what is this thing we're trying to emulate for. Then we will choose the tools that can help us to actually build this emulator. Step three, we will go dive into a little bit detail on how we actually implement this thing. Finally, we will do a brief reflection on why do we care about how a computer works. So first thing first, my goal is to build an emula uh, emulator for Game Boy. Uh, emulate for a small, simple computer. So what is a computer? And by the way, when I say computer here, I'm referring to those very simple computers based on 8-bit unit process. So every simple computer is at least composed from three things. First, memory unit, which is a storage area that holding some value we will be using later on the process. I.O represents for input and output. So some example for input can be a button, 
output can be screen display or sound, and most importantly, CPU, central processing unit. This is the core, the brain of a computer. Cool, uh, that's the basic. Now let's pick the tools that can help us build this emulator. And this is actually a very important section because depend on what tools we choose, the way we approach a problem will be different. First tool, WebAssembly, also known as WASM. WebAssembly is a new browser language. It is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. This is how it looks like. This is an example of WebAssembly file in hexadecimal display. So it is basically a big array of binary data that is generated from a compiler. So we can run languages other than JavaScript on the browser. WebAssembly, it is a very performance language. And this is making it a very, very powerful tool for my emulator project. Let me show you a quick demo here. So what I'm trying to do here is to scroll the Nintendo logo on a Game Boy. On the right side is the actual Game Boy, and on the left side is the emulated Game Boy. Uh, let's see what happens. OK, on the left, my logo is coming down, doing great. And on the right, wow, it scrolled so smoothly. And this is the speed my emulator should have been scrolling the logo. So my emulator is running very, very slow. Or actually, it is not running slow. It is just doing a lot of, a lot of stuff. So in an actual Game Boy, the way we render a screen is by drawing the pixels one by one. And inside of that little screen, there are in total 23,000 pixels. And that's what I'm trying to do in my emulator, too. Within that past 10 seconds, my, my emulator has already been drawing the screen many, many times. And every time I draw, it needs to go through this huge loop, trying to get the image data of that 23,000 pixels, one by one. So as you can see, performance is a very crucial issue here. Even a little performance improvements can help me a lot. So going back to our WebAssembly, again, it is a performance language. So compared to JavaScript, WebAssembly is more efficient mainly for three reasons. First, the file size is small, so the browser can load it quicker. Second, the WebAssembly code is relatively close to the machine code, so the browser only needs to decode it instead of parsing it. You can think of it as you, can finally, you finally don't need an interpreter between your code and the computer, so the communication speed is much faster. Finally, streaming completion. Usually in JavaScript, uh, the browser can only compile the file after it finishes downloading the file. But with WebAssembly, the browser can compile while downloading the file. So there's also some time saved here. So when we talk about a web, uh, a web language, we usually uh, think about JavaScript. And as a new browser language, would WebAssembly ever replace JavaScript? We need to keep in mind that a language ecosystem, like libraries, is as important as the language itself. WebAssembly debuted only around 20, uh, 2015. So compared to the widely established JavaScript community and ecosystem, WebAssembly is still very small. At current stage, instead of replacing JavaScript, it is something that would work very well together with JavaScript on the browser. All right, our second tool, Rust. 
So we talked about WebAssembly. Uh, it is a binary format file. And it is very rare that we would like handwrite out the WebAssembly file. Uh, in most of the case, we will get a WebAssembly file by writing our code in another language and compile into them. Rust is one of those. Rust, uh, it is listed as the most loved language on the Stack Overflow survey for two years. But most importantly, the reason I picked Rust is because it is a statically typed language. This allows, uh, this means that Rust will give me certain kinds of guarantee that I needed. Rust is also a low, lower level language that would allow me to twiddle the bits. Let me explain a little bit more by what I mean. Rust is a statically typed language, which means the computer would always make sure that your variable is used in a consistent way. So for example, a Boolean can always only be a Boolean. It can never be accidentally added to a number, like in JavaScript. So if you have experience with a statically typed language before, then the Rust type system should feel natural and intuitive for you. But if you're diving in from a dynamically typed language, like JavaScript, then you can think of Rust type system, something like you finally got a seatbelt in your car. There's some extra steps you need to take. You will be keyboarding more, defining the types. And your movement will be kind of restricted from here. Because you need to make sure that your, your variable type is in sync across the entire project. Otherwise, Rust would not even compile for you. There's nothing like, oh, let me make a small change here just to test out and see the results. I'll come back and fix all the other stuff later. No, you cannot do that. This can be inconvenient sometimes. But in return, we get more safety. Rust would make sure that we are passing around correct data and handling all the possible logic branches. This is the kind of safety I wanted exactly for my emulator project. So after working on the emulator project for about uh, five months, now I have 8,000 lines of Rust code. This is not a huge code base, but it is huge enough that it's beyond my ability of keeping track of every single line, what they are doing that I wrote five months ago. So it is very likely that I can accidentally pass a number to a function where I should have passed a string to it. And then my emulator starts acting weirdly. I will spend hours and hours trying to debug like what's happening. And Rust can prevent me from making such a mistake. And so saving me hours and hours debugging time. Also, why would we care about handling all the logical uh, branches? Because users are terrible. They are unpredictable. I need to protect my little precious Game Boy emulator from them. And Rust can help me predict all the possible states my Game Boy emulator can end up being as a result of all those kind of weird user input. So I can handle them now instead of waiting until much later someone actually breaks my code. Cool. Now we covered the basics, we got our tools. Let's dive deeper into the implementation details. So in the previous chapter, we talked about computer. So now we all know what a computer is, right? But not quite. We're missing a lot of details. Knowing a thing in theory and actually implementing a thing in practice are two totally different stories. It would force us to think about all those little but important details about how a computer actually works. Let's take uh, Tetris as, a, uh, as an example. In order to play a Tetris game on a Game Boy, 
we need to feed the Game Boy some Tetris uh, game file data. And this is an example of a Tetris game that I wrote a while ago using a language called Reason. Can anyone tell me where is the function we are trying to draw a game board? Yes, right there, in the middle, on line 43. But this is a file for a human. This is not something a computer is looking at. Instead, this is the one computer is looking at. Now, can anyone tell me where is the function we're trying to draw the game board? Yes, I heard the answer. We don't know. But you know, maybe computer is a little bit smarter than us. They, they're much smarter. They should know. Computer also doesn't know. So I used to fantasize about how smart a computer is. But actually, it turned out they are very, very dumb. They have no idea about all the objects, variable functions we're talking about. We are the smart ones who understand those abstract concepts. What was actually happening was we were breaking down our logics into very small, simple units so the computer can understand what to do. And those small, simple units is opcode. Opcodes are machine language instruction, usually represented by 8 or 16 bits of data in the original Game Boy. And there are, in total, only 500 opcodes, about 500 opcodes. And that's all the vocabulary a computer can understand. So going back to our Tetris example, what was exactly happening there? So here, what you can see is uh, on the top is my code of emulating the Game Boy. And on the bottom is a Tetris game file. So in every computer, there's a thing called PC, program counter. And it is basically indicating that where are we focusing on right now inside of this big memory, big array of memory data? It can point to the very beginning of the file. It can point to the very end of the file, or it actually can point to anywhere in a file. So in the computer, it would try to identify, try to read the memory data where our PC is pointing to, and identify which opcode it is. Uh, so for example, here, if our PC, now our PC is pointing to this memory data, A4. So in our program, we'll look for A4. All right, there it is. So this is the A4 opcode. I'm not going to dive deep into what this opcode is doing, but basically it is just like uh, reading some memory, doing some like manipulating memory data, and then saying, after you are done, move the PC to the next place. And as you can see, this is only two lines of code. The opcode ex uh, instruction is very, very simple. So what was actually happening when we load a Tetris file on a Game Boy is our computer would read wherever the PC is pointing to, identify which opcode it is, execute the instruction. Then move our PC, identify opcode, execute instruction. Then move PC, and et cetera, et cetera. So just to show you that I'm not making this up, <laughs> here's the Tetris game running on my Game Boy emulator. So I can play it, type A, level 0. Let me try to finish a line it's on the stage. And I can change the shape. I can speed up. I can go left. Boom. Yay, I got scores. <laughs> so what was happening? Everything here, what was happening, was just fu fundamentally speaking. Identify, uh, identify which opcode it is, execute the instruction, move PC, read memory, identify opcode, execute instruction. So, computer, it is not a black box. 
It is just made up from many, many small things that it's following its own super simple rules. All right, now we are finally in our step four. So it has been about five months since I started this uh, Game Boy emulator project. Uh, I've learned this performance and secure web, a new web browser language, WebAssembly. I've write some statically typed lower level language code in Rust. And I have opened a lot of computer black boxes, like opcodes, which we talked about, and a bunch of other stuff we didn't talk about, like CPU, video, timer. They're all very interesting topics. But let me pause here and ask a question a lot of you might have been wondering right now. Why would I care how a computer works? Maybe this is something can help you answer an uh, interview question better. Or maybe it is something that might make you look smart. You know, you can have a talk on the stage and everyone think you are smart. But in reality, none of this matters. What really matters is about breaking out of the box. I hated it when people started to label me as a front-end engineer. And I hated it even more when I started to constrain myself inside of the front-end engineer label. I was telling myself that, oh, all those lower-level stuff, the back-end stuff, it's just too complicated. That's smart people thing. I should live inside of my little JavaScript, HTML, and CSS world. I hated that I felt so powerless and constrained. But now, after working on this project, after implementing a Game Boy emulator, I feel much more powerful. I was able to grow as an engineer in a way that I would have never been able to if I was just working on some day-to-day -day work stuff. As some concrete example, now I am more aware of different kind of edge cases. This is mainly due to the Rust type system forcing me to handle all those weird edge cases. So now it's kind of a habit for me to go look after for them. Also, I am more fearless diving into unknowns. Either it's a bug, a new code base, or a new tech stack because I have already been battling with unknowns for months, those one and zero and computer fundamental unknowns, what the worst can be. And most importantly, I realized that the way I learned started to change. So before, I was learning uh, in a way that trying to find a pattern of given an input, what would a line of out a code output be? So I was copy-pasting the solution from Stack Overflow. But now, I ask more why and how questions. Because I realized we are not working inside of a box. Either it is a language like JavaScript, or framework like React, or any other cool stuff like Webpack, CDN, HTTP. It is just another layer of service we are enjoying. So it is a tool. It is not the world we are living inside of. So it seems to me, in order to grow, in order to grow as an opinionated, thoughtful, and a powerful engineer, we need to keep learning new tools so we can execute and learn more efficiently. We need to keep learning new programming philosophy so we can be aware of alternative solutions, compare the trade-offs, so to come up with Better, uh, uh, better decisions and write better code. And maybe we need to under have some understanding on the computer fundamentals, so we will not be afraid of learning unknowns and diving deep. And maybe the way we expose ourselves to all those new learnings are by doing some crazy and fun stuff. For example, maybe one day you will be giving a talk at a conference and you decided to do something fun. 
you decided that you will make your chalk slide from a hacked Pokemon file that is running on a Game Boy emulator. So the very initial introductory uh, program I showed you, it was a hacked Pokemon file running on a Game Boy emulator. But it was not the Game Boy emulator I wrote. It was somebody else's emulator. Let me show you how it looks like on my emulator. Uh, forgive me for doing this. I just really wanted to show a live demo instead of a video recording. So I'm editing the file, make sure it's recompiling, building, called the screen should re-render. There we are. All right, reason, cool. Wow, there's some weird background stuff going on. Uh, you will see eventually some logo there and the monster will start fighting each other, but something's off, like the layers is a little bit off and there will some, have some like ran, random stuff showing the background. So this is the real state of today, how my Game Boy emulator looks like. Uh, this is very far from perfect. But still, I think this is very cool. We are, we are running a Game Boy emulator on a browser that is running a hacked Pokemon file, which is about to build a Game Boy emulator with Rust that would compile into WebAssembly, which would be running on a browser. But anyways, this is a to-be-continued story. So if anyone is interested, you can follow me on Twitter or GitHub. I just open-sourced my emulator project last night. Thank you.